Hi, Father Alex here, host of the Godcast podcast, also the vicar of St Matthew's Church in Burnley, and also the author of Our Daily Bread, From Argos to the Altar, a priest story, which a book, uh, a book which is out now. I hope you enjoy this podcast that's coming up with Simon Nelson from the Milltown Brothers. Uh, this site has is, is got loads of amazing interviews with musicians, such as uh, Spider Stacy from The Post, Rick Witter from Shed 7, and loads of uh, Jonathan Higgs from uh, Everything Everything. So if you like your music, go check it out. Uh, but if you like politics, there's lots of politicians on there. If you like faith, there's uh, clergy, bishops, uh, esteemed academics from the world of uh, Christianity. Uh, so something for everyone to do. Check it out. And if you enjoy it, then uh, please uh, subscribe by uh, uh, just clicking on the bottom in the right-hand corner of uh, the YouTube clip. So uh, thanks for tuning in. And I uh, do hope you enjoy this uh, interview now with uh, Simon Nelson from uh, the Milltown Brothers. Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, joining uh, me on the Godcast this week is uh, Simon Nelson, who is original member and guitarist of uh, a prominent East Lancashire band, the Milltown Brothers. The Milltown Brothers formed in the late 80s. They had a successful period um, with the album Slinky in and recently uh, performed at a sold out gig over in Hebden Bridge. Simon, it's it's absolutely brilliant to get you on the Godcast. How's things? Oh, really well, and, and it's a pleasure to be here, uh, Alex. Uh, thank you very much for 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 inviting us to to come on. Thank you. So, originally from Cold, are you still in East Lancashire, Simon? Have you moved away, or I, I actually, yeah, I, I live away, and uh, I live down near Peterborough in Cambridgeshire, actually, where uh, my wife's uh, family were from. So, when we had kids, uh, we moved out of London and uh, we settled here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've. Uh, my heart is in East Lancashire always, uh, uh, but um, uh, I haven't really lived there since sort of like I left to go to university and what have you. So, but but I'm always going back to watch, uh, you know, to obviously meet up with the lads and uh, watch Burnley when I can. I was a big Clarets fan, so uh, yeah. yeah, very much my, um, a strong affection for the area still. Absolutely, you miss it when you when you're away. You kind of yeah, have yeah, de- yeah de- definitely. I mean, around here it's uh, it's you know it's lovely. Um, middle English countryside. It's actually very, very flat, you know, quite near to the fens, and it's drier and um, very agricultural. And uh, you know, when, you, when when I go up north, I always miss the sort of rolling hills, Pendle, with its sense of uh, your know, mysticism and all all all, all the uh, industrial towns. You know, it's in the blood, definitely. Yeah, and and recently uh, you were back on the stage over at uh, Hebden Bridge. Was that? Um... Was that a joyful experience? Or were you quite nervous about it? Or well, I, I, yeah, a little bit nervous. Yeah, we 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 um we, we found out quite early that it sold out quite a lot, which which you know made us sharpen up our rehearsals. <laughs> uh, very much at Groove Studios in Burnley, so we came up to re- rehearse in Burnley with with Chris up there and. Uh, yeah, we, we, I must admit, yeah, we're a little bit nervous. It's been the first time we played live under our own steam for really quite a long time. Uh, We've done a couple of festivals in the in sort of when we released Long Road in about 2015, but playing under our just under our own name that had been quite a long time. But uh, joyful is the right word, uh, Alex. It was a wonderful night, and um, we got a fabulous reception that we're really grateful for. And uh, it's a great venue over there, and recommend it to anybody. It's it, it was a a really lovely experience, yeah. And it gets, it's given us the taste to do some more um, uh, c- coming up uh, before Christmas and hopefully after Christmas. Yeah. What what prompted you to do it? It's a good, yeah, good question because we we haven't been doing very much. I, I actually had quite a big birthday or, earlier in the in the year, and we we I think we, we we're we we're, we're friends really, and and it's always a a pleasure to sort of play together. So we use that as a kind of excuse to go out for a meal, have a few beers, and also to rehearse. And we found that it was enjoyable, and um, we were thinking of what would be a good venue. Not too ambitious because it's been a long time. Obviously, we wouldn't expect to play somewhere like the Mechanics or perhaps Coma Municipal. And and very very kindly, Malcolm put us on over at um at the Hebden Bridge and uh, and it and it sold out and it, it was fabulous and it's really it helped our social media platforms and the support we're getting through there is great. So it's it's you know it was fun. So why not let let let's do some more? Yeah, yeah. it's good. 
And I guess there were some familiar faces in the audience, people who... Yeah, people oh. who we hadn't seen for a long time. People have come from quite a long way away, and obviously quite quite a few come over from East Lancashire and other parts of Lancashire and, and Yorkshire as well. But people coming out from Scotland, Nottingham, from the south, it was it was wonderful. Yeah, we we, we got some very loyal and and uh, much appreciated fans over the years, and uh, it was lovely to see them and perform for them again. It was great. Yeah, and and for people who who aren't familiar. Uh, with the Milton Brothers, you, you know your brother was his uh, lead singer, isn't he, and and part of the band. I yeah. was interested to ask Simon where it all kind of began, where the kind of love for music and and your kind of just take us back to the time when you first picked up a guitar and what yeah. it was behind it. Um, I think well, you know, there always been some music in the house. My dad played piano, and he, um, you know, Sunday mornings to to relax, you'd, you'd hear the sound of the piano coming up the stairs and what have you. So. There was always a kind of fascination for it, and you know, in my uh, early, you, you know, early sort of formative years, even before, sort of in my, you know, pre-teens, you'd listen to Top of the Pops, and there'll be all the, you know, pop music of the day, you know, Slade, etc., things like that at the time. But my brother Mark, my eldest brother Mark, picked up the guitar first, and um, you know, he was the one that really inspired me to pick up the guitar as well, and. And, you know, that time sort of being 14, 15, 16, it was a time of new wave punk and things like that. So I I was really into, you know, bands like The Jam, The Undertones and uh, Flaming Groovies and American bands like Television and things like that. So I, I was always, even with a few little basic bar chords, was trying to write songs and sort of uh, achieve that kind of new wavy punky sound. So that that was really my introduction in my, in my teenage years to it, yeah. Yeah, did it did it come quite naturally? Uh, um, or was it was it a bit of a, a bit of a struggle at first? Or? It was a bit of a struggle. It was, it, mastering the old bar chords was quite. I remember that being quite difficult. So I used my my brother's old. He had a, a Telecaster copy, and you know, I'd have a little practice amp, and you listen to you put records on to try and listen to them back in those days, and. Uh, um, yeah, I, w- I wouldn't say I was a complete natural, no, but I was always ambitious to write songs and perform, but I was being a bit of a show off. So at school, I had bands and um, we'd perform, and then went on to university and I had a band there, and uh, which a uh, part of that morphed into the Milltown Brothers, actually. So the band I was in at university, the, the Word Association, we would tour uh, uh, for a time. I, I studied French, and so I was, I was based in France, in Paris. and in the summers, we'd go down to the uh, near Bézier, Cap d'Agde and Montpellier and play on, play on the, um, in the bars and stuff there. And we did that for four summers. And on the last one in 87, Matthew came down and joined us. And he was in a band in Lancaster at the time called The Spire. And the two of us kind of morphed together in the autumn of 87. So that was the, that was the sort of beginning of, uh, of the Milltown Brothers back then. Yeah. Um, um, and what was the kind of the... Um... I suppose there's an element of luck, but obviously there's there's the aspect that you're, you're decent. What was the kind of, how did it evolve that you got a, a record deal? Yeah, we, we did have a bit of luck. And initially things moved very quickly. Uh, uh, I'd not had a great deal of luck in the Word Association. We'd lived in London and it'd been a real battle and we'd, we'd done a little bit. But with the, with the Milltown Brothers, we, we, we were, I think forming in Manchester helped. And we played in Manchester at the Boardwalk and at the university. But I was based in London at the time. I was working down there. So I I took a a cassette out, a demo tape, and got us some gigs at the Time Box in uh, in Kentish Town and places like that. And, uh, you know, Dingwalls, things like that. So the lads would come down in a hired van and we'd play in the summer of 88 in London. And very, you know, fortuitously, Steve Lamack was at one of those gigs. We were first on. And he saw us play, and there was nobody. One man and his dog in the in the room, really, literally, we were first on, and he really liked it. gave us a great review, and after that, we we, we started to get interest. And uh, you know, before too long, NME were were were, were comparing us to the Sundays. We're going to be the next big thing. And by the end of '88, we we had uh, an EMI publishing deal, and it was it was you know going really quickly, um, and a great contrast to what I'd felt before. And, 
but after that time, in sort of eighty nine, we we did have to really buckle down a bit. Then um, you know the the music was changing a bit. We'd started out being a bit more like I guess the Water Boys, uh, Martin Stevenson and the Dainties, the kind of kind of feel Hot House Flowers even kind of thing. And it changed a bit as the music changed in eighty nine, and we had to shape up and and really worked very hard and tore a lot um, and released a couple of indie singles before we were finally signed to A&M in 1990, early 1990. Just tell us about that time, Simon, because, you know, you, I guess you're not getting paid uh, megabucks for touring around. You, you're almost, like you say, you're having to play where you can, aren't you, to get your... Yeah, yeah. Your but... there. How, how do you manage financially in a situation? Yeah, well, we, yeah it, we, we were given a, a fairly decent uh, advance from EMI I mean, not a lot. I think it was about 25 grand, of which we bought some new equipment. We bought a, a long wheelbase transit, bright orange, and that helped us because that enabled us to go and play wherever we wanted. And, you know, I remember we would tour, for example, we had an agent and he sent us off on, on tour to places like rural Wales and we play Lampeter, Aberystwyth and, you know, all around. And it was a really good, tough sort of... Um, uh, training ground for us and you know we'd sleep on people's floors and you know do it the old-fashioned hard way and it, but it was great it, it was wonderful I wouldn't have changed it for anything it was it was great fun and and then what happened well then you know I think really things changed for us I think with this with the release of which way should I jump through big round records which is a an indie label based at to strawberry studios in Manchester we got I think we got single of the week in enemy and the tour in the autumn you know, we were being looked at by record companies quite seriously. Um, and I think we 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 demoed for AM at the end of 1990. You know, we we're touring all the play, time, playing a lot and, and being watched a lot by a lot of companies. They come down and check us out. And and we 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 demoed for them and they were very happy with the demo in Christmas 89, 90. And we signed for them in, in 1990. So having things gone quite quickly in sort of 88. It was a more of a struggle in '89, and much more like hard work to get the record deal. That was a much, much, much harder thing. And when you got that deal, can you remember your emotions and how that felt? Yeah, I'm, I mean, yeah, delighted. I mean, we, we, we it, it was um, the fruits of, of hard work, and but I do remember when we signed for them, the, the head of the record company. If you know, we, we meant to imagine you get lots of champagne; it'd be a big party. But he'd forgotten to buy champagne, so he had to send his secretary out to <laughs> around the local shop, and it was warm. But at least we got champagne. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was great. What was the what was the biggest difference, uh, Simon, about being signed to a label than kind of uh, plowing your old furrow, as it were? You know, were you kind of being yeah, the... yeah, go on. Um... I think that you know things are taken out of y y your hands a little bit uh, in terms of you know they they you put, they get the promotion you get a radio plugger um, you've got a big machine behind you to to pay for the recording contracts you, you, you're made to feel good you're going there and the, you, you're a recording artist you, you, and it, it it does give you a big lift and the, it gives you the pressure as well you know that they're spending a lot of money on it and they you know you don't think about it but you know at some point down the track that they're going to want that money back but I think it gave us a great deal of confidence and once we'd signed we we actually had a period of writing you know three or four songs four or five actually and demoing them after being signed, that eventually ended up on Slinky. So it gave us a lot of confidence and, and, and motivation and inspiration. I think it, it was a really positive thing for us. And, and the recording of Slinky down in Bath Moles was just a lovely experience in the summer of 1990. Were, were, were there any um, red lights early on, you know, that, that it might all go a bit sour? Um I'm trying to think. Uh, well, a little bit, you know, you, you first released the first single, uh, um, uh, Apple Green, you know, only sort of went, went into about 89 and you did get a bit of a worry. Oh, my goodness. You know, what if the album comes out and totally flops? What on earth are we going to do? They're going to want the money back. We'll be out in the street, you know, things like that. But but then um, which which way should I jump came out and you know he got a lot of radio play we we got on the TV um, we were toured ourselves and then we toured a fabulous tour with the Lars from Liverpool they were they were great and we loved that, that and uh, 
So the, the warning signs were probably more coming towards the end of that year. I remember playing in Portsmouth Poly and uh, some guy said, I remember saying, I think he was the, one of the uh, the uh, the guys doing the sound and he said, are you enjoying yourselves at the moment? I said, oh yeah, we're having a great time. So said, said uh, uh, always treat people well on the way up because you, you never know what it's going to be like on the way down. And that stuck with me. And uh, before you know it, in a couple of years, we were on our way down. So uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear. I mean, I was just looking, uh, looking you up on, on YouTube and there's, you were on Wogan, weren't you? And and yeah. you were, I know uh, people might laugh when you say you were on Blue Peter, but these were these were mainstream uh, t- TV channels that gave you great exposure. And they did, yeah. We, we were on going live, um, um, and um, uh, which I think, yeah. I mean, what I remember what one particular one particular day we did we did we were playing at um, there's a big I can't remember the venue in Charing Cross uh, we played uh, we played there and we did Wogan in the after we sound checked to the gig did Wogan did the gig flew to America to play a tour the next day so you know the, the, we we were in a really good sweet spot at that time and um, yeah so uh, and it just uh, didn't quite. Didn't quite sort of, um, you know, although we charted with Slinky did chart and top 30, which we should have jumped charted. Um, it, it, uh, we couldn't just push it on from there, which was a shame. Did you, so, so Slinky was top 30 album, was it? Or top? It was 27, it peaked. 27. Yeah. So was that considered a success then? But by, by firstly, by you, the band, um, and was it considered kind of a good start by the record label or, or not? Yeah, I, I, th- I think we were really pleased. I remember um, we, we uh, was charting and we were celebrating it. We were playing with the Lars at the Town and Country Club in, in, in London. And we thought we'd done really well with that. It got five-star review in Q magazine and that that's quite rare. So so the the, uh, the critics were, were, were seemingly were, were liking it a lot. I mean, sales to get to 27 is, is good, but it's not stellar. Um, you know, some of our peers like Rides and, and uh, Mock Turtles, they were going higher, the Lars were going a lot higher than that. But for us, you know, we, we were very pleased with that. And I think the record company were thinking, yeah, this is a really good start. We could push on with the next record and take these guys into the top 10. I mean, that was really the feeling. Um, we'd had a bit of a knockback with the, the, the second single, Here I Stand, which had... Uh, had sort of midweek at sort of 31 and we were all set up for Top of the Pops and we went out with the promotional team in East Lanx and and sold a lot basically and they waited us back to 41 and that that was a, a moment that was was difficult and perhaps mm. changed the pathway for us but you know I think 20 you know being 27 in the charts is we were pretty pleased with it yeah and what was the deal like for multi-albums Simon was yeah. it four fives what was what was the deal I tried yeah, it was on an ongoing renewal basis. So we was we were signed. We, they were happy enough to sign us for the second record. So uh, I think it, it was a multiple uh, album deal, but reviewed on each one, each release. So uh, uh, the second record, Valve, um, we we did in '92, which was in '93, which ended up being a real difficult second record, <laughs> classic uh, experience. Um, and was, uh, was that because the the label had taken too much control. Um, you lost your kind of artistic freedom. What what was what was it? I think it was a combination of things. I think we lost a bit of confidence because they knocked us back with some of the early recordings we did. For example, in uh, in Oxfordshire, we we did a set of three tracks and they didn't like them, particularly the record label. And musical musical um, tastes had changed. You know, the previous autumn we toured the states and we had our first sort of exposure to grunge we you know played uh to a festival in boston in 91 in september october and nirvana were playing and and you know we we went to watch them you know we played then we went to watch them and i couldn't quite get it at first i thought it sounded like heavy metal and like black sabbath i thought yeah, i don't get this and then you heard the record and you thought wow yeah i get it it's it's really brilliant songwriting and it it changed and i think we tried to catch up and you know I would sort of jangle pop sort of uh, singles like Here I Stand which was she had a jump Apple Green you had to move on and you had to we, we tried to sort of add a, a, a heavier edge to it and ended up with a bit of a compromise involved which you know in hindsight was a you know a combination of us being 
the songwriting not have been as good and not being as focused, losing confidence and the record company losing confidence. And that it ended up with a bit of a, a mishmash of an album that didn't do so well, really. And was was the end not too long after that then? It, well, yeah, about 93, we they didn't sign us for another record. So we did a tour and um, try to think back then. I think we're all friends. It didn't really affect the friendship of the, of the, the, the yeah. lad. I remember we played Derby and I think Barney had had enough by then. And we were playing, we'd gone from playing full, you know, to a thousand people, even 1500 sometimes. And then we were playing at the Derby warehouse in front of 125, 150. Um, and even though I totally appreciate those 150 people coming to watch us, don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. But but I think it became obvious that uh, you're chasing your tail a bit. And it's a, it's a spiral downwards, and uh, yeah, I think Barney was the first to to realise that, and he had other ambitions with his songwriting, and he went on to play with with other bands. Then and we tried to keep going as a four piece, and then ultimately even as a three piece with the uh, with me, Matthew, and James. Um, but by '95, we kind of called it a day for a while. So yeah, it was. Uh, and uh, yeah, you, 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 yeah, we were left a bit in the lurch. Then actually, that was a bit of a yeah. tough. Period. I, I chatted to Rick Witter from Shed Seven about you know the kind of a the winding up of a band. What what was that? What was that like for you, Simon? Particularly afterwards, yeah. not so much the split, but you know those the month or two's go by, and were you less thinking, well, what do I do now? I was, yeah, and uh, I remember it quite well. It was I was living in with my wife in a uh, flat in in London in. Um, Hornsey, well, uh, Holloway Road, and you know, I, I've been used, you know, in a period of playing gigs all the time, being busy and recording, and then to nothing, and the realization there was no money coming in. Uh, you're feeling very sorry for yourself, you know, sitting drinking Holston pills a lot. I drank a lot, and I went in a bit of a spiral. And I think we all did. We were all in a very dark mood, dark place. Try to revive it and everyone came down to London and it was the winter of 94, 95, pretty unpleasant and, and realised that I had to get a job. So, yeah, it you know, it happens. And, it, uh, you know, you, you, you think in football and things like that in sport, there's quite a lot of support for, 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 for sportsmen who don't make it or they have a career and it goes mm -hmm. wrong. There isn't that for musicians. Not not, not saying that there should be, but... Um, yeah, it's uh, you know leaning on the crutch of drinking too much and other things to keep you going. So uh, yeah, we went through that a bit. Did, did you uh, did you fall out of love with music at that point, or or did you kind of? I think we must. Have, I think we must have done, Alice. Yeah, I think yeah. we did. I think the songwriting went right off then. We were trying all sorts of things, being desperate and uh, loss of focus. Um, we got it back a, a bit towards the end of the 90s. We had a band called Milo. Um, uh, Steve uh, uh, Taylor was on bass at that time and Matthew Neen and me. We, we got close then. We recorded demos for Ireland. Um, and I think, you know, James was in a band at the time in this, um, the show Ponies and Barney was very busy. So everybody kept around music and and we we, we got back together in 2002 to do our third record, Rubber Band, which was self-financed. Recorded part of that in Cohen at the Derby Arms, actually. So yeah. that was that was quite and, interesting. And, and when you're doing it for love rather than you know like the um, the dosh, not that yeah. you not that you were doing it for the dosh, but obviously dosh is important. But yeah, you, you got to live, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you've got to live. Was was that was that album um, as as significant as Slinky in that regard, you know, that it that it actually kind of brought you back together and I, I think for the first two weeks of recording and maybe four weeks, it was, it was felt great. We we're all back together we were recording. We were the um uh you know we a producer we, we the, it was like being in a gang again. We'd go out at night and 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 live the experience of being a musician for two to three weeks. And then as everybody got back to their jobs, you know, I'd taken two, three weeks off holiday it became much harder to to give the time and, and make a record properly in it. And again, it became a bit of a compromise, a bit of a piecemeal record that at the end of the day, we probably weren't as satisfied as, as we'd hoped for. So initially, yes, but ultimately uh, things had, had changed. Yeah. Yeah. And were you, were you working in the music industry or did you go off and do something completely different? Yeah, I, I did something completely different. I was working for a market research company in London, um, 
which uh, in Islington and uh, yeah, and everyone else. Matt, Matt Matthew moved into working at Granada Studios. Um, I think um, Nian was working in, uh, I think in the fashion business and Barney had kept on in music and James was doing, a, 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 I think he'd gone back to academia then. I think he was doing a, a master's. So yeah, we, we, we were all sort of doing different things. Um, but uh, uh, and yeah, the, ultimately that that probably sh came through in uh, in uh, in the record that we made at that time. And and, and how often does kind of uh, what might have been into the ether? You know, do do you sometimes think, gosh, if only this or only that, or you yeah, know? I think so. I think that, that you know that there you know you, you see that some of our peers, you know, you know, Oasis supported us, for example, in Manchester and. You see, you know, their uh, meteoric rise thereafter, and you know, we we play with, um, uh, you know, Blur. We were on a on a on a on the sort of same level as them for a little while through nineteen ninety one, and you just wonder if maybe here I stand hadn't been waiting out of the charts, would we have gone on top of the pops? Would Slinky have sold another thirty forty thousand? Would we have, you know? But you know, you've you've got to. You know, you know, when I contrast it with my experience with my first band, the Word Association, what happened with us with the Milton Brothers was sensational. You know, it was it was chalk and cheese, and I'm yeah. eternally grateful for that because I've seen it from both sides. I, I'm just wondering, uh, Simon, if you, uh, you know, I I came and saw you in those days at the Mechanics and. Uh, you know, um, that you had a following, didn't you? And and the people of East Lancashire were like, "These are our lads. These are our boys." Was there any uh, ever a feeling that you'd let the let your? I mean, Berlin and Eat Corn are very colloquial places, aren't they? Yeah. And are kind of very loyal. Did did you feel like you didn't let the guys down in that regard at any point? Yeah, a little bit. You know, you, you yeah. I remember we did we played Mechanics at the end of ninety one. It's real celebration Christmas. Um, uh, just before Christmas, and it, it was sold out mechanics, and I felt so proud to to represent. You know, if it, if I can say that, I represent the area. You know, with Burnley fans, you know, died in the wall. First time I saw Burnley was in 1972 at Bloomfield Road. We lost four two. I I, have, I was there when you know we beat Orient. I was on the be all end, and you know, I'm very very. My heart's in in that area, yeah. definitely. And I remember playing at Municipal Hall, and 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 the record company coming up, and they could see where we came from. And you know, when it all slips away, it, it yeah, it's a bit in the back of your mind that you say, oh, why can't why? Look, there's Turf Mall. <laughs> I was gonna, I was about to say for people who are listening rather than watching, uh, yeah. Simon over his uh, his right shoulder's got a an elevated picture of uh, the, our beloved Turf Mall there. So, yeah. My brother Mark painted that. He's an artist. Mark. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so I give Mark Mark's, a plug. <laughs> yeah. Mark, yeah. We, yeah. I think we did a little. But um, I suppose also, uh, what can I say? But yeah, for me, yes. Yes. I, I you know, I, oh, you want to hold your hat? hat. You know, used to go in the spar and put in Sparrow Hall because it was a pub you go to and people recognize you. And it was great. It felt wonderful. Yeah. Mm. Um. But um, and I hope you know, hope you know, seeing people come over at Hebden Bridge, um, we we playing Cantina in Lancaster, which two of the lads come from Lancaster, so mm -hmm. that's a connection. While we're playing on the twenty fifth of November at um, Cantina in Lancaster, um, we we have a connection to there as well, obviously. But you know, I hope we can play. Well, I know we are playing. We're playing in Barlick actually at the um, Music and uh, Arts Club on the twenty third. Yeah. I think that's already sold out um, yeah. of a Christmas party gig, but we will play if 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 people want us to play in East Langs, we would definitely definitely play yeah. if, if if people want us to. And what about new stuff? Is there any plans or? Um, yes, I, 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 I possibly. I think Matthew's is um, he's kind of in the made songwriter in the last two albums. You know, he and I would collaborate more on Slinky and uh, Val, but. Since that time, he's kind of he's had a sort of like um, his um, he's had a very strong focus in direction and songwriting. But he and I, uh, I'm, I'm going up to Lancashire on Thursday, and I'm I'm hoping that he and I have a little session, and we got a few ideas. And he wants to in introduce a new song to the Cantina set. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully. I, I, I'm guessing it must feel brilliant just being back together as a band. I mean. Again, I don't want to keep name dropping Rick Witter, but 
you know, you said ultimately, you know, these were my mates when we were kids, so, you know, yeah. and then we're back and it just we do it because we love it and people like us to do it. I, I echo those thoughts, absolutely. I mean, they, they had, a, you know, more success than us, I think, Shed Seven, I have to admit that. But the principle and, and uh, the the feelings and that he expressed would, would apply to us very much so, yeah. Yeah, and and um, I'm always, I'm always interested with musicians, uh, Simon, because sometimes there's an assumption that if you play rock and roll or whatever it is, that that's that's what you like. But what are your other musical uh, interests and influences? Uh, you know, I was interested. To, I interviewed an opera singer who did like who turned out he liked thrash metal, which was just it was like chalk and cheese. What what can he? What floats your boat these days? Um, that's a good question, actually. I mean, um, my wife very much likes listening to a classic FM, right? And I'm constantly, you know, as a songwriter or a guitarist, you think listening to melodies and things like that. So I have that that kind of world. I have entered that kind of world a little bit and beginning to appreciate some classical music more than than in the past. Um, actually, and actually, on the other scale, I, I really quite like so early. So early rootsy blues as well, which I never used to. And um, but um, I know you know I played in the covers band that we did lots of Beatles in called in a ta- in a village called Elton in Cambridgeshire, and the 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 the, the other some guys wanted to create a Beatles covers band, so with the Eltones. So yeah, uh, I, I was introduced to a lot a lot more Beatles than I had been in the past, but. Uh, um, I still quite really like driven melodic guitars. I must say, Alex, that's my sweet spot. I really, we, we were listening to Fables of the Reconstruction by uh, REM before the gig, and I still really like that sort of very South Southern Gothic, and even over Californian psychedelic guitar. That that, you, that that's still the thing that really I, I like. Yeah, I don't think they're going to get back together, are they? It's kind no. of it's called it a day, hasn't he? Yeah, I, I, I believe so. Yeah, more's the pity because I mean their their songbook is is uh, is wonderful. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just uh, we've lived through a golden era of music, haven't we? I mean, I I just constantly find myself in any downtime just trying to seek out new bands, and I know I know George Harrison's not a new artist by any means, but I've just been exploring his his solo work, and I've been kind of quite blown away by it. And then there's so many gifts and Golden nuggets still out there to find out there in the world of music, def- most definitely. I was reading that you're a big Depeche Mode fan, aren't you? I was looking into that. Yeah, I am a huge. Is it? Yeah, I've yeah. I've followed Depeche Mode since I was a a boy, and I've seen them on every tour. And I I've got the old Depeche Mode tap. Oh, good, good, and, yeah. And I and I saw them this year in Twickenham, and yeah, and I'm a, a bit electronic band that kind of involved, you know, a, a more of a bluesy rock band now. I would say. Yeah, I mean, they, they introduced the guitar into that band with fantastic effect, didn't they? I mean, what a way to do it. Start out as an electronic band, then, you know, throw in some fabulous guitar leaks. I mean, they're, they're purveyors of, of, of really brilliant pop music. That You know, oh, it's not really my cup of tea, but I totally appreciate the uh, uh, the, the quality of the writing and, the you know, what, what they're all about, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, Simon, I've, re- I've I've this sat off and I was flown by. I've loved chatting to you. Are the, re- are the rest of the guys as um, enthusiastic about you about these gigs? Yeah, I th- yeah I'm definitely having done, having felt a little bit of trepidation at Hebden Bridge. Um, it's given us the taste to do it again, and the intention is to you know we have got Cantina in Lancaster on the 25th. We're playing in Bonalzic on the 20 23rd of December, and I think we're going to do a set of gigs in the new year with the hope of doing some festivals over the summer. And we're hoping to get the uh, the master of Slinky and we're going to reissue that hopefully through an indie label and promote that next year as well, adding adding a couple of tracks to the original and producing a, a box set as well. Uh, yeah, so I've got to uh, ask this question now, Simon, you've just said that. Do you own your material? You know what? This morning I just sent an email to a guy called Paul at Universal uh, Universal Music, um, UCG, I think that they call, uh, uh, setting out what we wanted to do and, and trying to find out if we own the master copies or if they own it because they took over A&M Records and asking him, so I had to give my PRS number, I've given the catalogue number and I, I'm, I'm making the inquiry at the moment. Mm. So 
I hope we do. It would be fabulous. I could go down, you'd go down to London and pick it up. But m more likely that they still own it and we'd have to pay a licensing fee, I would have thought. It's so interesting, isn't it? And people will be intrigued by that, that your music isn't yours necessarily, but it's yours. <laughs> have to pay to have it back to put it out again. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, yeah. Oh, well, Simon, thanks again. And, um, you know, who knows, maybe the mechanics, eh? I would lo love to. Love to play Burnley, you know. Up the clarets. <laughs> up the clarets, yeah. Do you think we'll stay up, Simon? Oh, I was thinking about that. You know what? I think there may be three worst teams. I think we play really good football, but it seems a bit, doesn't it's a bit like an under 23 side, isn't it? Yeah. A little bit naive. But when we play Forest and when we played, um, obviously, Luton, you know, we, we're competing and yeah. we've had good moments, haven't well, we? Yeah. We had a fabulous first half against Chelsea and then we conceded yeah. and then we just fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. Collapsed. Maybe that's it. Yeah. yeah. I think we. I, Something tells me, hopefully, we might come good. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I think you're right. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. Yeah. So just plug that gig one last time in Lancaster. Yes. So um, tickets still available for our gig in at Cantina in Lancaster on uh, November the 25th. That The tickets are available at Skiddle, which is a, an online ticketing platform. I think you can get the link from our Facebook and from our Twitter uh, pages. Uh, just a big thank you to Jonathan Bibby and Andy Devaney for all the work they're doing for us as well. And big love to Debs as well, who's uh, a big fan of ours, having a lot of problems with her mother at the moment. Uh, ah. Very well. So shout out to them. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, all the best with everything that comes up. And uh, and uh, definitely look forward to seeing you up in, in Lancashire very soon. Thank you very much, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.